welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream of my friends. And I have here with me today, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And Landon, what are we talking about today? We're talking about the Hunger Games movie. Oh my God. You guys, you guys, we're not done with the Hunger Games. Yes, we've covered the books, but there's still movies to cover. Okay. There's still the additional book to cover and it's getting made into a movie in December. So um, we're here today to talk all about the adaptations. So we are putting this all together in one episode. We're not covering each of the movies or anything like that. This is just one episode about the Hunger Games movies. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing today. That's what we're doing today. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then also on that same same note, uh, as far as uh, like a summary of all of this, I'm going to tell you that the movies exactly the same as the books. Yeah. So if you want to know what the heck happened in the movies, uh, go re- go watch our other streams where we covered what happened in the books. Yep. <laughs> Yep. So no, no summary today. This is still, however, of course, not a spoiler free podcast oh, no. um, or any of that stuff. So yeah. Also, welcome in Lunar. I see you here with the first today. Thank you for that, Howl. Um, so so yeah, no, no summary today, because literally, if we were to summarize these movies, we would be just uh, telling you the same thing that we did in the book summaries, because it's almost the same. We are going to talk about some of the major differences, because there are a few. But the main things that we're going to cover is like what we dislike and what we like about these as adaptations because the story is so similar there's really no reason to talk about like liking the movies on their own so we're really going to be discussing them like and how they function as an adaptation yeah so yeah uh so we're going to talk about the right wrong and the everywhere in between as far as that goes but yeah so the hungry is movies woo let's get started (laughs) all right do they see the the beautiful deck yep i switched it over they can see the deck they can see the deck well, let's start how we start every single episode of Enter Stage Window with our favorite things. Now, we've talked about a lot of things that we love in the Hunger Games, but I think we're trying to keep these especially to uh, the movies. So, mm-hmm. Karen, what was your favorite thing? Okay. So as you guys know, in these movies, there's quite a lot added in that we don't see in the books, which we're going to talk more in detail about later. But my favorite thing from the movies is one of these added scenes. And it's when the um, citizens of the district get together and they go and attack the dam. It is just amazingly shot. I love that it has uh, the the song from the hanging tree playing in the background. I love the rendition of that song. Um, Landon, can you do a click? Can you do a click for me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, so I just I love this, and it's one of these scenes that I truly believe like that happened. And the only reason we don't get these details about it in the book is because Katniss wasn't there, and it's a first person point of view book. So. But I truly believe it happened. Like, I think that it makes a lot of sense based on what we do know about everything going on in The Mockingjay. And uh, and I just love it. It's so powerful. And like, yeah. I remember when I was first watching this movie, like when it first came out and it happened, like I, I thought like, oh, that movie was short because I thought this was like a climax. It's not. It happens like halfway through this the first Mockingjay movie. But I thought like, oh, what a great climax for the first movie because they're going to split it in half. But no, it keeps going. But it's like that powerful that, that I thought that. And I still to this day will sometimes go back and listen to the Hanging Tree version of the song that takes place in this scene because it just like it just hits me so hard. So good. I think. Uh, the, th- the we'll talk about a lot of the things that this movie that these movies franchises did really well but uh, it's really hard when you enter into the first book first book and first movie with children killing children mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. continuously level up the tension so that your audience at no point feels like the stakes aren't real or doesn't feel connected to the tension and this is one of the amazing moments in this movie where it's like holy moly, you made me feel something. And I thought we were beyond feeling things at this mm-hmm. point. <laughs> mm-hmm, uh, sure. This is definitely one of those moments where it's just like, shit's getting real. Yeah, yeah, it was so good. It was so good. Um, So that's my favorite thing from these movies. Um, Landon, what is your favorite thing? One of my absolute favorite things uh, is President Snow. And in particular... In the very first movie, we have this beautiful monologue done by President Snow about uh, how 
fear and hope and the delicate balance of keeping people oppressed with it, uh, that you have to have a certain level of fear and you have to have a certain level of hope, but too much hope or too much fear means that there will be a, a revolution on, on your hands. And I think that it is so accurate and such an amazing observation of oppression that I, it just was like one of those things where I was like, oh my God, this feels real. Holy moly. <laughs> it's true. It's so good. And um, and I, I do love that these books got adaptations because the structure of the book makes it so we could have never heard something like this. Mm -hmm. um, but the movies, because they are not just from Katniss's perspective, we get to have this and we get to have this, um, this sort of scene. And um, if you guys aren't aware... The newest book that's out, um, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, is told from Snow's point of view. So um, if you're interested to hear Landon's opinion about that book, which she has not started yet, but she's going to, um, then you should definitely drop us a follow on Twitch because we're going to be talking about that next month in September. That's going to be our podcast episode. I'm very excited. Uh, I think anyone who's watched these or listened to these enough knows how I feel about villains and how I feel about villains getting stories uh and that is very much positive uh so i am very much looking forward to the starts of president snow before mm -hmm. he was the man that he that we knew him as yes yes we get to see his origins um and i think we we didn't we don't have a picture for it but there was a bonus favorite thing that you had yes, as well also related was. to snow that you wanted to mention uh and that was just some of these subtle details uh, in there and that was um there is a moment where snow in the in the last two movies uh his granddaughter is obsessed with Katniss and as the as as all of the capital children are and as the propaganda of anti-Katniss grows and grows there is this subtle scene in which uh the granddaughter realizes how much her grandfather hates Katniss and undoes the braid that uh, that she had made just to copy Katniss. And it was like this one moment of, I think, really encaps encapsulating uh, the how propaganda works in such a subtle way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of being like, oh, you know, you talk about it being bad so much that little girls suddenly realize that they shouldn't be related to this thing. Yeah. Yeah, for real. Um, that's a really cool scene too. And the the actress doesn't uh doesn't get very many scenes, but um she yeah. does a really good really good job with that scene where she's like, oh shit, and she's like doing the braid really quickly. Um, I We're just gonna... I, I just recently skimmed through the movies again this morning um to gather some screenshots and uh, and I I watched that scene again. I was like, oh yeah, this is so good. <laughs> it's just like a it's just like a gun punching scene, and I think that that's like what the last few movies and I think all the movies do it really well. And we'll we'll talk about some of our favorite scenes later in the episode, but it just adds so much depth to the world mm -hmm. in a in a book that is lacking it. Not because Susan Collins is a bad writer but because it is a first person narrative story which means that we don't see that stuff from Katniss's yep. point of view we're focused on what Katniss is focused on yep. but when you're in a movie you can expand the world in such subtle ways and the directors are the two directors for the four different movies made amazing choices mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. both totally of them agree totally agree um, but before we get into too much of that, we want to talk about some of the changes in general that we neither put in the dislike or the like category exactly, just like major differences that we want to point out and acknowledge and analyze just a little bit. Um, the first one having to do with Prim. So Madge's are removed from the movies and a lot of Madge's parts are given to Say and Prim. Also, when they are all in District 13, in the books, there's a bunch of other District 12 people, um, one girl in particular, and all of her parts are given to Prim. Basically, Prim's part is incredibly expanded, and all of the characters that are just like these little bit characters are removed and given to Prim. Um, and in a because in a book, you can have a character that's like just for a specific purpose but in a movie that's a whole other actor that you yeah. have to like have on set and pay and all of these things and I I really um think that the choice of giving those parts 
to Prim is is particularly interesting because one of the few flaws of the books is that Prim is not given enough weight compared to how clearly important she is to Katniss. And I do feel like that's a flaw of the books that maybe like when Suzanne Collins was writing it, she didn't quite understand how important Prim was to the story. I mean, she did, but like there's, there's parts where I think that Prim could have been given a little bit more based on how important she is to Katniss's trajectory. And I feel like the movies saying like, well, we don't really need this character, this character, this character. How are we going to fix that? Oh, give it to Prim is like, ah, that was really smart doing that. Right. Can I interject with just a little bit of like yeah, yeah. insight into the into the publishing industry as well as like the genre of that point in time? Uh, as we've discussed on this podcast, uh, you, young adult as a genre is a fairly new genre in terms of publication and was an incredibly popular one. Uh, and and Hunger Games came out as a really kind of towing the line of what could be allowed (laughs) could be allowed in uh in in YA uh especially with like the level of violence and everything like that and there was I don't know this for sure but I wouldn't be surprised if if there was a larger role that Prim played especially in the final book uh, as Katniss was able to reflect a little bit more deeply on her relationship with her sister. And then because of her death, it had to get cut because people were like, oh, we don't want children to be sad. We can have we can have children think about the concept of killing other children, but the actual effects are something that we can't really talk about yet. The industry has certainly changed since then, but you'll notice that there's a lot of like, interesting edits out in some of that early YA stuff to to uh separate grief and death from children in their stories it's a very interesting thing yeah I wouldn't so, be surprised at not all for if that's sh- not case. for sure knowing that but she's just kind of like reading around it I'm like ah that's why this might be the choice that was made I could totally see it. Like, obviously, we have no proof of that or anything, but I could totally see that. Thank you so much, Lunar, for the 5K bits. I'm going to say that those 5K 5K bits are for Prim and how amazing Prim is. And also her actress. Her actress in this just does such a good job with the stuff that she's given. Such a good... So, and also, like, I appreciate how... Obviously, they look very different, but there are, like, enough mannerisms that J-Law... And the actress for Prim, I felt like, made choices to give them that sort of, like, sisterly bond. Like, you could yeah. tell that they worked together well. Yeah. Yeah, they so did. I mean, and you feel it throughout the whole all the movies. Even though yes. the actress for Prim is very young in the first movie, um, you still feel it really, really strongly. There are um, some other differences, though. Um, the next one, I think, is probably the most obvious, and that is Effie. So, in the books when they are in district 13 it is the uh stylist group there's like two or three of them right the, i think it's the three stylists and and they are taken into district 13 they don't really understand how district 13 works they they take extra portions and they keep getting told don't stop taking extra portions we're going to punish you and they don't understand eventually they get punished and katniss finds them like beaten and hungry and scared and she's like the fuck you guys and then after that they are freed and uh, and help her and uh, and presumably they continue to take extra portions and no one punishes them because they still clearly don't understand. So that's how it goes down in the in the books. But in the movies, the stylists simply aren't developed enough um, for that to be like meaningful in the movies. So instead, all of their parts are given over to Effie. And the part about how they're taking extra food is simply removed. So there's kind of like some good and some bad with this particular change. Um, But I do I do like that it gives Effie more screen time. I do, too, especially (laughs) because like she she I feel like was such an iconic character that people didn't really expect fandom to love because she is Mm -hmm. not as lovable in the books. Mm -hmm. Uh, But she is played so extremely well that it's like, oh, we do love her. Yeah. <laughs> we want to see I, more of her. 
I I want to, I, I mean I I only hope I can be as uh, as cool and as charming as Effie is someday. Like I would love to be Effie Trinket when I grow up. <laughs> yes. Uh, movie version. I, um, movie version. So so yeah, I I am remiss that we miss that crucial element of the harshness of District Thirteen. Um, but you know Elizabeth Banks and two more movies. Like I can't really complain about that. And and that complain. is kind of different in in the movies that District Thirteen overall just doesn't seem as as harsh like I don't get the feeling that it's it's so incredibly oppressive as I do in the books yes and I and I think that that's for uh simplis- simplifying the story uh which is why it's not necessarily in our bad section um it is not as harsh it is not as bad it is not as uh regimented and militaristic as it is in the books and i think that that's for the sake of the consumer there's a lot it's a lot easier to have nuance in novels than it is in movies uh because there's a lot more telling in novels yeah. you're literally using words and so like Katniss can have a thought about how militaristic it is and express about like why it has to be mm-hmm. you can't do that in a movie as easily no, so you can't <laughs> so in order to be in order to really feed into that good versus evil trope uh it, the district 13 had to be a little bit more consumerable and a literal a bit better for the average american watcher I would think so, because you still want to root for District 13 to be the winners, the rebels to be the winners. And in the books, I I have no problem rooting for them either, despite the fact that they're very harsh. When I think about, like, would I rather live in the districts or would I rather live in District 13? I don't know. Honestly, that's a tough choice. But in the in the movies, that's not really a thought. Like you would obviously want to live in 13 more than any of the districts, except for maybe one or two, you know, Um, but in the but but you still but in the movies, I think if they showed the harshness, it would be harder to root for District 13 and the rebels to win. Yes, and I also think it would it would it would make the conclusion a lot difficult to understand of being like, no, in the in the movies, the thesis statement is basically coin is the bad guy. Yeah. Uh it, it the the thing is is that in the books, it's coin is the bad guy because of how District 13 is run uh and how power works under District 13. And it mm-hmm. wasn't necessarily coin herself. Yeah. Uh it just happened to be in her favor. Mm-hmm. Uh which is more true to how actual systems work. Yeah. Uh but it's a lot easier to just sit there and be like, coin bad. <laughs> District 13 good. It's no bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's for the sure. The leaders that are bad, not the for system. Sure. It's just it's just different when you have like a visual medium and actual actors versus words on a page. It's just different. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just always gonna be different. Yeah. yeah. So so uh, I, I think this this choice is like in some ways I, I dislike it, but in some ways I, I don't mind it. So that's why it's in the neutral category. And I think like you feel the same way, right, Landon? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's like one of those things where it's like, okay, I get why it has to be. I It, it ruins the point a little bit, but I get why. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like I might have made the same decision if I was in charge, you know, of, of yes. adapting these, you know. Exactly. Um, yep. And then, of course, uh, we disagree a little bit on this one. Yeah, we're going to talk about this that's one. Why it's in, <laughs> that's why it's in uh, this is... Uh, classic part two example oh my god yep because by then by this time there was a clear um advantage from hollywood's business perspective to split the final chapter into two because you can film it all at once you can edit it all at once you can produce it all at once so you're you have like a little bit of a longer like shoot and editing process but a slightly longer one versus two completely separate ones Which one is cheaper? Obviously, the slightly longer production cycle. It's only one production cycle. And then you release it twice. So you earn your ticket money twice, right? So obvious. And by this time, so many movies had done it that it was like like the clear, like from the business perspective, clearly what they should do. Um, uh, I And and also here, we had been burned. Like we had had, especially in the YA world, we had had stupid ass part ones and parts two harry potter mm, sucked but like mm. twilight uh 
had come and gone as part one and part two, which was yeah. the stupidest choice of yeah. all time. Uh, and was truly a money grab. And so all of a sudden we're going into mocking Jag, being like, why the fuck is this another part two movie? Yes. It's stupid. Yes. Um, so a couple of a couple of things in regards to this on my personal opinion. I think this is another one that they should not have split into part one and part two. It creates the same problem that it does in The Matrix. We talked about that, where you have like a movie of setup and a movie of payoff. And when you are watching them in the way that they were released in like the, the, the time that it came out, like there was a big disconnect there. If you watch them back to back today, you don't feel that nearly as much because you get to watch it all in one sitting. Um, but still, the money grab element of it is uh, is still clear and still quite uncomfortable. However, mm-hmm. Landon was not made nearly as uncomfortable as I was. So if you could tell a little bit about I your feelings there. didn't hate it. Um, my biggest problem with the book was that it felt so rushed. Uh, most of the book for me felt like a montage scene rather than actual scenes and so getting the movie where dynamics and relationships and certain story beats really got to hold power worked for me uh i i connected more to katniss's missing Peta and her concern about what was happening and the threat of the threat that the that the the building of the war that was happening and the expansion of the war i felt that so much more powerfully because it was a part one and part two movie uh i think that if they had tried to fit everything in to a two-hour movie which was the standard of what was being approved at that point in time it would have flopped completely so um, here's here's my deal with it though. Titanic had been done happened and Hollywood just wasn't like they knew they they could have made a 3 hour movie and they chose not to because I'm of money. Sorry, that's comparing donuts with apples. No it's you not. Can, yes it is. Hollywood can, only oh, made it two parts. Literally the only reason they made it I, two parts was for money. I agree that there this is a money grab. Totally understand the money grab. However, I don't think it was as bad as Matrix. I don't think it was as bad as Twilight. I don't think it was as bad as Harry Potter. Yes. Yes, Titanic had already come and gone. Yes, the Lord of the Rings had already come and gone. But it's really, I, I think that trying to say that like Titanic did it is you cannot compare Titanic, a romance James Cameron movie, to a third installment of an action YA interpretation adaptation. Titanic has a lot of action, just saying. Also, isn't I, I guess it's as, I guess as it's Titanic nice. being my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> I love it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I guess it's nice that Hunger Games can be the most beautiful shit on the shit pile. Um, you know, yes. that's nice uh, for it, I suppose. I can't disagree I... that it's the best of this type of thing i just still hate it i don't <laughs> i i i i resent it because it is a wave it is in the shit pile but i think that if it had been the first to do it we would have no problem oh i don't disagree with that if it had been the first to do it i i would have less problem with it and people were definitely tired of it by this point because when you look at the box office for the hunger games movies mocking j part 2 the finale has by far far the worst box office like it's no contest between Mockingjay part two and the other three movies like the other three movies box office were great Mockingjay part two was mid I think yeah I think the hype at that point had also been I mean yeah I think that's the other thing too that when people are are balancing this this idea in fandom uh you have to recognize that stuff has stopped coming out Mm -hmm. fandom has an attention span of the of like I like to think half the length of the series that it took to build it afterwards. Oh, that so, feels kind of true, doesn't it? It feels very true where it's like, oh, okay, Hunger Games came out between 2012 and 2016. That's not the actual years. I think it's 28 and 2012. You got two more years after 2012. You got until 20, 2014, 2016 to 
actually like make an impression. And if you extend that past that, people have forgotten it. They've moved on to the next thing. Yeah, I want to say for all of like the major fandoms that have ex- that have existed um, in the time that I've been active in fandom, the only one that that doesn't really hold true for was Harry Potter. I think every mm-hmm. all the other fandoms, yeah, that's basically how it goes down. But I also think Harry Potter, uh, a lot of the fandom got built in with them. Like there is there is a separate fandom that almost exists for book and movie. Yeah. Uh, and now I think we're starting to see the decline. And I think that's because it's half the time after the movies have come out. <laughs> also because they released a bunch of shitty movies, which didn't yes. help. <laughs> uh, oh, God. Anyway, we, any, we haven't even talked about this freaking new series coming on hbo oh Oh. god yeah if y'all if y'all want us if y'all want us to um do reviews of the new hbo series let us know because it's not in the plans (laughs) right now and i don't know if we if we want to do it i think we probably want to do other things but if y'all are truly interested please let us know so we can weigh that as an option i think it would mostly just be us roasting it it would be probably yeah that's probably what would happen (laughs) <laughs> so live, live it, to, react to it <laughs> to uh to kind of like to kind of like keep with this sort of negative trajectory that we're on at this moment um landon let's next talk about what we dislike what we disliked about uh these um yeah because you can't like everything we love these you movies like just to everything. be clear we're about to yeah. do a bunch of bitches oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we love these movies we are we are strongly net positive of these movies mm-hmm. however you can't like everything especially when it comes to an adaptation we're going to be hella critical about it. And I'm sorry, but you're the third major YA, like third major YA series to hit big and to hit Hollywood screens. We've been burned before. And that's what a lot of this is going to come down to. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So first, we'd like to talk about PETA. There is not enough screen time for PETA, especially in the first one. I He's just, so charming. And where I is just, he? I just need to, I just need to congratulate you on this screen grab. This right? is the perfect expression for where in the world is Peter Malark. <laughs> he is supposed to be this super fucking charming, super swanky, super like a kind guy, uh, and it succeeds in it. He becomes almost the like people like him so much that they call her, they call Katniss the darling of the capital because yeah. they think. Peta liking Katniss makes her likable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has four scenes that in the in the movie. It's just, <laughs> it's just like they. The problem is, is without Katniss's inner monologue and her conflictions about Peta, which of course don't exist in the movie because there's, you know, it's a movie, it's not a book. Um, Peta needs more extra scenes so that we can understand how cool and charming he is. Because we're missing that since we don't have Katniss's inner monologue and we don't get any extra scenes. Everything that happens in the movie to Peta and with Peta is exactly the same things that happen with Peta and to Peta in the books. And so we we just we literally just have Peta's scenes without Katniss's like hemming and hawing about whether she likes him, doesn't like him. You know, he's this, he's that. I owe him and blah, 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 blah. Like without all of that. And what you end up with is like, he's a guy, I guess. He's but a that's guy. That's not really him. He's very charming. Watches. And we only get one moment where we believe that. And it's the inter- it's this interview actually with Caesar. And um and there were much nicer screenshots I could have taken of him. I did I did do this on purpose. <laughs> it's so good. It's so he's just like, oh fuck, what am I doing here? <laughs> like uh no, I think like I think one of the the th- like one of the downfalls is the memes that happened because of PETA. PETA mm-hmm. is not supposed to be memeful. Mm-mm, he's supposed mm-mm. to be a really cool guy. Mm-hmm. But we got the meme of him freaking grabbing her leg as he's covered in paint and being like i've been watching you like (laughs) like it's his obsession with like watching her walk home uh it's it it doesn't give charming and this is me just throwing shit at the wall to see if it sticks but do you think that part of that might have been because they wanted to increase the the love triangle tension that yes honestly truly yes i really do believe that because there's another because you just mentioned the one scene that has another sin against Peta that i really dislike and it's when he does the camouflage by the river and like it looks so fucking good and i'm like a teenager who learned how to do this from decorating cakes this is what it looks like this is not what i was imagining when i was reading books oh my god he's he's a teenager 
Okay, He's that's like the artistry of a 40-year-old. Come on. They're murdering, they're murdering children. That's that's the teenager line. We have 12-year-olds fully ass throwing daggers at shit. And your line is the fact that PETA can paint good. I'm just saying, I'm saying. I have seen some good ass artistry from teenagers and it don't look like that. That is professional work. And I remember when I was watching the movie the first time, it made me laugh. Honestly, that scene when you saw him and realized it was yeah. Peta, it made me laugh because it was so ridiculous. It was. This entire movie is ridiculous. The whole thing is. Uh, but yes, I because it's like Gail got a little bit of extra screen time. PETA didn't get as much screen time and like this is something that we said in our review of Hunger Games like people literally liked Gail more because of Gail's face yeah and people didn't understand that Josh Hutcherson is hot like he's hot he's good he's great and if they Mm -hmm. had made him as charming and as funny and had let Josh like actually be like I think what he was capable of being and that we see a little bit later on uh people would have liked Peter more he just needed one or two extra scenes in the first movie honestly that would have solved everything if they would have just had one or two extra scenes of like maybe him and Hamish without Katniss like if we would have actually had the scene of him planning all the shit without Katniss with him and Hamish I think that would have solved it and it could have been like a, a two or three minute scene it wouldn't have to be long and just see like how he interacts when she's not around and that would have fixed it. And then it wouldn't or, have been like, why, why does she care about PETA? You know? Or even him, even adding a scene in which she is around. Like we get that one where her, she's like complimenting how good he is at, at care at like painting and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But if we had had another training where he like was super impressed by her or uh, helped her or, or anything was just, like, really charming, especially around the cameras, because that's the other thing, too, is that, like, they they were supposed to propagandize this relationship so much in the media, and there's very little interaction previous to that. If there mm-hmm. had been, like, if there had been, if we had been privy almost to that propaganda, Caesar had, like, shown us clips or something of the two of them, like, that could have been yes. an interesting take that would have, like, let us understand his character a little bit more yeah, and what if people you didn't, saw. If you didn't read the books, you did not understand from this first movie how, like, cool and nice PETA is supposed to be. Yeah. And safe. Like, that's the, that's the thing, that PETA is safe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Yep. Second inside out that is the everdeen edition uh katniss is a really tough character to like when you are not inside her mind yes and j-law acts the shit out of this character Mm -hmm. i think if anybody else had had this character we would have hated katniss the way that we hate bella yeah so i'm from twilight yeah like the only reason people mildly don't dislike Katniss is because J-Law went in with her full chest. Yeah. And even so for the first movie, if you just watched the movie and didn't read the book, a lot of people really did like think that Jennifer Lawrence was an absolutely terrible actress because they did not understand Katniss's character. Um, But if you read the books, like she was doing exactly what Katniss would do, exactly the way Katniss would do it. But in the movie, you don't understand that she has spent a lot of time training herself to like not show her emotions on her face. And I think it takes until partway through the second movie for you to even understand that. Whereas in the book, you understand it instantly. But in the movie, it just takes a while for that idea to kind of take hold in your mind. So people that only watch the movies, I remember like reviews coming out after the first movie about how shit of an actress J-Law was. And uh, and it was all from people who just hadn't read the books and they just didn't know because the movie doesn't do anything to tell you how she is and why she's doing it. (laughs) I think... um... A couple, yeah, I think you said the thing of, like, it takes until about halfway through the second movie for you to realize, like, who she is. Mm -hmm. And I can remember those moments so clearly. And they are both with PETA. 
It is mm-hmm. the color. It is the, what is your favorite color on the train? And it is the pearl. Yep. And those moments, it was like, holy shit. You watch as J- Jennifer Lawrence breaks down the mask that Katniss has been wearing in front of everybody. And if you love the character, you understand how significant that is. It's so significant. Like it isn't an pivotal part because that's like when Finnick discovers that she's like not the stone cold bitch as well. It's what a lot of people discover it. Yep. If they and, had and the been able is, to she, move, she gets hate because of Bella too. She gets hate because of oh, Bella. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if they had been able to move one or two scenes like that into, like, I think that if they, it would have been a little bit out of character. But I think that if there had been a little bit more of a human moment in the cave with Peta. If, if that, like, crack in her and, like, been able to show J-Law's talent, people would have not disliked her so much. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. she, but J-Law and Katniss 100% get hate off of the wings of Bella Swan mm-hmm. and Kristen Stewart. Which, by the way, Kristen Stewart's a phenomenal actress and played Bella Swan exactly as Bella Swan is. The problem, the, the issue is, especially with this particular genre during this particular time in YA history, uh, people were writing books for the sole purpose of letting young women be the character in these stories, be the representation. And because of that, they had to be, as we've lovingly referred to it on this channel, pants. Yeah. And I don't believe that Katniss is pants. Like, I don't believe that Katniss is pants. However, um, understanding the trends at the time and watching the movie without reading the books, it's totally understandable that someone could come away with like, oh, great, another pants girl. Yay. Or also... Or also disliking the, like, I think that there was a split there. It was like, oh, great. Just another, just another girl with no emotions who can't act in the situation between two love, love interests and, and something that she feels special and she's super good. And so it's like that concept of, yeah, it might be pants. And then also angry that it isn't pants. Mm -hmm. So many people hated Katniss Everdeen and hated J-Law and how she played it because it wasn't how they would react. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's the whole freaking point. <laughs> yep. 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 No, no one ever said that uh, the teenagers have the best reading comprehension. Um, not that adults yes. all do either, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that is for sure. Uh, yeah. I think I think Katniss is one of the first characters that breaks and really starts the new trend of uh, strong female main characters. Yep. And unfortunately, yep. the movie was just caught up in the era that was still incredibly misogynistic and still is, but was even more so against the female main characters of action YA series. The point is is that Jennifer Lawrence gets hate for this role for stuff that had nothing to do with her. Nothing. She did a perfect job. In my opinion. She is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I think that she like, she's such a subtle like actress that she really owns the characters yep, and yep, yep. i think that this is this is a perfect example of this and if she had played a character like this that was in any other situation than necessarily a large budget action ya series she would have walked away with some sort of a award for this yeah for, for oh, this yeah, yeah, role yeah. that she did uh, with the subtleties that she acted in mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yes um all right, and so we went from Peta to Katniss. Who's next? Finnick. Finnick. Uh deals with the same fucking issues. Yeah. Here's the deal. Uh, the TDL about Finnick is Finnick is an incredibly complex character with a very pretty face. And what the movies gave him was a very pretty face. And nobody wanted the complex characters. Yeah. Uh, because he was just so goddamn pretty. Yeah, I do think that in the movies, Finnick doesn't get as much complexity as he is owed, in particular in the Mockingjay movies, because they kind of rearrange a couple of things in that movie in, in regards to like how they Katniss and Finnick end up in the actual battle, right? They're, in the book, there's this whole like training regimen that they have to go on. 
um, where Katniss has to realize that her problem is like following orders and she has to learn how to follow orders. And it's kind of rearranged in, in the, um, in the movie and Finnick, uh, Finnick goes to, through this same thing, um, where he has to realize his flaws or whatever to get to join. And he does. And, uh, and because the main things that because a lot of that's rearranged in the movies and the main things that Finnick really gets to do is taunt Kat- Katniss in this scene and then do the wedding scene with Annie. Um, you don't really, you don't really understand Finnick in the movies in the same way that you do in the books. You don't get an opportunity to feel like you understand why like he's able to do what he does and be as annoying as he is and get away with it. You know, you just you just don't understand it in the movies the way you do in the books because a lot of that stuff is cut and i think in the movies they also don't have him um they also don't have really the scene where he he tells uh, about what the capital did and how they trafficked him yeah. right like that doesn't happen no. in the movies that doesn't it, it's hinted at as far as like like there's he, a line he he trades in secrets and that yeah, he has yeah. to get close to people for tre- secrets and it's kind of in between the lines there but it, it certainly is not outwardly said that he is prostituted uh and that he protects annie like like that's the other thing too is that a huge part of finnick is this relationship he has with annie and none of it is really built there's a line where he is speaking to the camera where he's speaking to annie about protecting her and would do anything to come back to her and then all the girls get like riled up because he's the you know beautiful boy of the capital and they could be talking about like her like Mm -hmm. that's the purpose of it in the books but it really is a message for annie and then there's beautiful wedding that happens we don't care in the movies because a we never really see annie and don't understand like all the things he does to protect her Mm -hmm. and how vastly and fiercely he loves her Mm -hmm. so it Mm -hmm. isn't this heart-wrenching moment of being like they were newlyweds uh, she's pregnant like none of that exists of of fear in the in the movies yep and then the same thing that happened to jennifer lawrence only sam claflin doesn't get hate for it but yeah. uh the reason why Finnick is still good in the movies is because sam does an amazing job playing all of that regardless of the fact that the script doesn't really give it to him Um, because again, just a lot of those scenes just don't exist in the movies in the same way that we can't, we don't have Katniss's inner monologue in the movies. We don't have some of the key scenes that help you understand Finnick. So, um, so you just have to get it through Sam's performance and he does an amazing job. He does really, really good, um, in this, in this movie. And, uh, and of course, because, because he's a guy and because it's like a slightly different type of problem he doesn't get really any hate for it um Mm -hmm. the way that jennifer lawrence does and he's also not the main character so he's not the main focus and people don't really notice but he he suffers from the exact same problem is the point exact same problem yeah yeah um all right the adventures of haymitch and the hollywood magic of sobriety oh my gosh here's the deal haymitch in the movies lovable father figure who harrelson does great has a tough time, then discovers some reason to be sober, gets sober, doesn't really struggle with it except for a throwaway line here and there, and his life, and he lives happily ever after, uh, giving a little kiss to everyone's favorite Effie Trinket. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's so, not his story. <laughs> it's really not in in the in the books. In the first book, he really struggles to sober up to try to help. Peta and Katniss um he really does not believe there's any point and he's just going to get drunk again like he does every Hunger Games and Peta convinces him that that's dumb Katniss doesn't really come Peta convinces him okay that that's dumb and sober he needs to sober up and help them and uh, and he does and it's very hard for him and he doesn't really do a very good job at it because he still just goes with his instinct favoring Katniss and he's pretty shitty to Peta even though like he really shouldn't be um, mm-hmm. And all of these things. And in the movie, you don't really understand any of that because you're not really seeing it. And so then what happens in the second movie when Katniss comes in and like dumps the water on him because he's passed out drunk and he's supposed to be awake and helping them with their tour. It Katniss just kind of looks like a bitch because you don't really see the struggles that she and Hamish went through in the first movie and like how bad his alcoholism really is. 
Um, so she just kind of looks like a jerk, and but she's really not. <laughs> well, and then he never he never drinks again. Yeah, basically. Like in, the, in the entire series, he never drinks again. Yeah, and he it never is gets like drunk. This, it is like, oh, he is he is an alcoholic when it is convenient for him to be an alcoholic. Yeah. Um, and he never drinks again. And it's it's uh I think a detriment to this character to the to the depth of his character. It works in the movies. Because we also never get to know Hamish. Yeah. You never learn about his story. You never understand his trauma. You never understand this. And I think that if we had his his trauma, if we had his story and didn't have his, the like drunkenness and the terrible things that he does and the jerk that he is, we would hate Hamish. Yeah. So you need either both of these things. Mm-hmm. Or neither of these things. Mm-hmm. And they chose to go with neither of these things, which really erases a one of my favorite side characters in a YA series. Yeah, he's great. He's really good. And then and then just to to comment on the Effie and Hamish thing. Okay. Like I was in the fandom, all right. I was shipping it. I'm not gonna lie. Okay, I was. Didn't expect the movies to make it canonish. That was weird. And it didn't make any sense. It and was just I, a cute kiss, I guess. Like, like for me, I was like, oh, okay. This is like, it's... kissing is such a weird thing, uh, especially in society, because there are some levels of our American society where like giving a friend a kiss is an appropriate thing to do, especially in like this generation of, of Woody Harrelson and Effie Trinket. And so that's just like what I figured as it was. It was just like a little friendly peck of goodbye. Uh I loved it. I shipped it, but I was just like, it's whatever. Uh, but it was like, okay, everyone went crazy for it. I was like, they're never going to see each other again. Effie's not moving to District 12. And Hamish is not the fuck about to move away from his basically surrogate daughter. Yeah, no absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. The only way they're together is if, is if, like, is if Hamish um, decides not to stay with Katniss, which would never happen. Never happen. Um, they're on a hey, they, Nomad, they how's meet, it going? Hey, they meet. They meet. They meet in the middle once a year. That's the only way that it works. I, I guess. I guess. I don't know. It like it doesn't make any sense. It's very silly. Um, yeah. So poor Hamish get also his character gets um, gutted a bit in the movies. Um, it's which, unfortunate. Which. I think was like one of those things where it's not my biggest dislike because it had to happen to somebody. Yeah. And at least they, at least there was depth to this character. At least I felt like there was still a purpose in what he played. And there was yeah. nothing necessarily that I walked away from the movie being like, this is lacking. Unlike with Finnick. Yeah. Um, I never at any point in time was just like, man, I wish they did more with Hamish. I do wish on the interpretation, but I understand why they didn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense for sure. All right. Now we're going to come to the, oh, we're going to come to the thing that I, I hate. Okay. You guys, I did rewatch this movie for y'all and it made me nauseous. And I just, I just, why? Okay. I'm so glad that the director of the first movie is not the director of all of the movies. Y'all in the first movie, not a steady shot in sight. It's shaky the whole fucking time. Like I can't see the final battle, you know, where they're fighting, um, whatever his name is, Cato or whatever on top of the thing. And it's like, I'm what so the sorry. fuck happened? I have no, I have no idea. No idea what happened. Like, did you forget his name? Oh my God. I no idea you. what happened. Well, I, I mean, I just, I, I just, it's shaky. There's like s- shots of like that that aren't even action shots that where like it's a hand cam going all around. And I'm like, oh my god, someone get the cameraman a tripod. Holy shit. I can't see anything. This first movie, this alone, in my opinion, makes the first movie a bad movie. And there's so much good about it, but this, this is the worst decision ever i hate the first movie so much you guys for this reason and this reason alone all the praise i heaped on it on it this overrides all of it can't stand it it's the worst aria you get it thank you i don't i don't get motion sickness so it doesn't bother me uh i think it would have been a better director's choice to have the first half 
up until she's in the games to be with study cam and then and then go to handheld uh once she's in the games to reflect her panic and her need to survive and i think that would have been a much better directorial choice but i but i'm not I don't get motion sickness. So it is not an issue for me. I respect Karen's. This movie horror. wants me to throw up. It Rain. wants me to barf all over myself. Um, I like the movie, but I understand that it might inhibit some people from being able to enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, it's literally ableist. Like the person who made this doesn't care about people with motion sickness. This movie's ableist as fuck. I said it. I stand by that's it. That's a that's a take. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. They probably they, yeah. they're they're not the person that made this movie is not ableist. Okay, they just don't. They just are it's casual. Just, no. It's just they just don't think about it like most people. That's they all. wanted it to feel gritty and yeah, serious, yeah, 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 yeah. real, they and and they, they failed because because it really does take half the movie to understand what the fuck is happening. Yeah, uh, and then and then you're like, and then they enter the arena, and you're like, this would have been the good time to use this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's <laughs> handheld she, cam. Almost every shot is yeah, handheld cam. Which, Almost every shot. That's insane. Especially, like, there's even an argument to be said that, like, okay, out in the forest, rural, when she's hunting, that almost makes sense. And then every time she's, like, in society or especially in the capital, it doesn't make any sense to have a fucking. Yeah, there's there's shots of her in her house interacting with her mom and Prim that are handheld cam. Why? It it doesn't make any sense. And it's like, no, those are the moments in which she is, like, on uh, you don't have to think about it like yeah. shaky cam makes you think why is it on shaky cam yeah and like my so my recollection of the movie looks like this screenshot a blurry mess like that's how i remember this movie <laughs> Bl- blurry mess and also nausea yeah. uh but we're gonna get to the the last thing that really it gets karen going uh the the worst sin that, oh this, my God. <laughs> that this should have done that this whole series did uh, and that that's that one stupid smile who told jennifer lawrence who told her this to do this who did she come up with this did the director i don't understand oh, no, 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 no. This, this must have this must have been a director because here's the thing j-law resting bitch face yes so is she but if the final <sighs> shot of the movie is her with resting bitch face that's that's not a good final shot. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's the deal with the epilogue, you guys. In the books, you remember from our last episode, us talking about the epilogue, it is very ambiguous how Katniss actually feels. Like, she feels safe, clearly, because she has kids with PETA, and she starts the book saying that she doesn't want to have kids because she doesn't want to bring them into this type of world. So she does have kids, so she does feel safe. But she's still haunted by what happened to her she has nightmares she's scared about what's gonna what her kids are gonna think and feel when they learn about the history of the hunger games which they will learn um the oldest one shortly uh is what's implied in the epilogue and she has a lot of conflicting feelings you know about like you know could we are is this is this sustainable like what's gonna happen like she's she's not happy she's just not terrified anymore and then in the movie she's like in a field and and Peta's there playing with the one kid she's holding the 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 baby the the younger kid and she's talking to the baby and that's all fine and then she just looks wistfully in the distance with the calmest little tiny smile I've ever seen she is not calm in this scene in the books and it just makes it seem like the ending is happy but it's not in the books the ending is like got all these different emotions going on but in the movie it's like happy ending yay and it just feels cheap is the truth it's just cheap that's that's why i don't like it it's because it's cheap i'm gonna compare this movie to uh to titanic again uh it's like when she drops necklace off of the thing and it's just like this Oh, I can rest at last, sort of thing. It's yeah. like, no, you can't. You have, you have a whole life. I do like Titanic, though. Maybe we should do a Titanic episode someday. Please make me do a Titanic episode. <laughs> I love Titanic. I could it's talk good, about that movie good. forever. But, but yeah, all right. It- in the books, I just I just love the epilogue in the books so much. And I feel like the closing expression that Katniss has here just kind of ruins the ambiguity of it for me that I felt was so like 
cool and complicated. So I just, I don't like the final shot. I'm cool with everything up until that one final shot. And then I'm like, wait, what? Why? People who are mad at the epilogue, I am convinced, only ever saw this version of the epilogue. Must have, because the epilogue in the movie is kind of like, eh? Huh? Yeah. It's like, wait, she just had kids and she's fine now? Yeah. It's like, that's not the what the epilogue says. <laughs> not what happens. That's not what happens. But um, it is what happens in the movie. But so much of the epilogue also couldn't have been shown in the movie with the epilogue. It's just complicated. It's very complicated. Just... And I get that in general, audiences are more satisfied with a happy ending. So if you've not read the books and you're that type of person that likes the happy ending and you weren't really here for like the personal political struggles that happen for it. And like, you're just here for like, you're just like watching a cool action movie. This epilogue is probably fine. And you probably don't think the smile is trash like I do. Um, And that that's probably most people, you know, but I was fully invested. And so for me, it was like, this is garbage. I didn't care. (laughs) (laughs) I knew the real ending. This is fine. This is like, I'm just like, cool. Great. She survived. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's most people, how it made them feel. So they probably didn't think anything of it, but I did. But you did. And that's important to acknowledge. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going to break, we're going to, we're going to break into a new segment here on uh, Enter Stage Window. Uh, I feel like we need music for this, but yeah, I'm like dancing to silent music. I feel like like, it should be. I'm like, I need, I, we need to have one of these, I feel like every episode. And that's the what the fuck fandom. Yeah. Uh, brought to you by audible.com slash interstage window. Yeah. So before we get into what the right. fuck fandom, go get audible. Go get audible. Audible is how uh, I listen to the books. It's also how I'm listening to, um, I'm listening to the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes right now on Audible. It's great. And you should get Audible too, because it's a good service. Yeah. I uh, was going to recommend that. Like everyone should just get Audible to listen to the Ballads of Song- Songbirds and Snakes. Yep. Uh, you get, you sign up, you get a free book. Mm-hmm, free book. Mm-hmm. Uh, every month that you're signed up, you get a book credit in which you could purchase another book. And then if you ever stop having Audible, you still own those books. They can't yep. take it away from you. Yeah, that's how I use it. Like, I don't pay for it every single month. Like, I'll pay for it for three or four months so I can download a few books, right, that I'm interested in. And then I'll cancel it until I'm done with those books. And then I sign up again. And I'll tell you guys, when you sign up again, they almost always give you a deal. So, yeah, do your first one with us. And then um, and then get a, get a book and then cancel it and then do it like that. And there you go. And it's a great service. I love it. And then you get to keep your books and you have a full online library accessible to you anywhere in the world as long as you have, you know, access to the internet. Yes. Uh, so do the thing. <laughs> yes. Okay. So the what what the fuck fandom? There's a couple things that we want to talk about. First is the racism. Jesus, oh, the racism. my God. Y'all, when these movies came out, the amount of bitching about why is Rue black was insane insane which is which listen white people are pretty terrible at realizing that people of color exist in in movies and tv shows and especially self-absorbed teenagers uh especially self-absorbed teenagers but she's described as black in the book literally it's like literally like don't get me wrong it would still be what the fuck if you were angry that they casted a black girl uh as like a character that like was not in your brain canonically black it's fuck it's fucking stupid to be angry at it but at least like you're acknowledging that you're really racist there yeah uh to be angry that she's black and then be because she's black in the book and then be with your full chest angry that she's black is just a level of what the fuck it's super what the fuck and we're not (laughs) going to spend too much time talking about this because here's what i want you guys to do click on this link i'm putting in the chat and put that video in your watch later if you've not seen it you need to watch it um it is about this topic and it does a much better job than uh, than either of us could. And it's incredibly well researched. Uh, if I was going to talk about this, I'd be basically saying almost everything that is in that video with very little changes. So you can get 95% of my opinion by watching this video because I, I basically agree. Um, and it's just it's just already well produced and well done. So you should just go give that a view instead. Yeah. So uh, 
we we heard that uh fandom is racist and we knew it but yeah. it sucks to see it, it. was insane uh, though it was insane then, watching it go down at the time in the second hand of all of that too is a being like angry that jennifer lawrence was not a person of color and that katniss everdeen was not a person of color when they believed that she was supposed to be and it's not we talked about this i believe we talked about this in our catching fire episode Mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. we talked about how uh her race was very uh connected to the idea of like a gray person which is outside the concept of the races that we have established here in modern day United States of America and that it's like more to do with classism than it necessarily Mm -hmm. has to do with race uh, and othering based on class and uh, that people got very angry that she was not portrayed as indigenous or Native American uh, which in itself is a little weird because it's like why why are you trying to why are you trying to do that? (laughs) Well so there's this thing so this when the when the movies first came out the complaining about this was very quiet on this side, but I feel like it's grown, um, you know, over over the course of the movies coming out, just more and more of this. And also just as the tides have kind of turned with the way that racism is spoken about on the Internet and within fandom, there's been more anger about this and then and kind of embarrassment about how people were uh, talking about Rue. Um, but with Jennifer Lawrence being cast as uh, Katniss, there she's not in the books like there's no hint that she is of any native tribe she's described as gray she has gray yeah. eyes and all the people from the seam are described as gray um in some form or fashion gray eyes gray toned skin gray hair things of that nature and that is not a racial category that we have today and it was supposed to give like some kind of visual i believe anyway what suzanne collins intention was is to give some kind of visual representation so you understood that all the people from the seam kind of looked the same but she yeah. didn't do it within like uh, a current day uh, racial context. So she wasn't trying, t- she was trying to kind of like racialize the class because that's probably yeah. how the people thought of it that that lived in this fictional world. But there's no allegory to like a certain race that we have today. It's just, that's just not the case. And I do think that yeah. the canons of Katniss being um, uh, of, of some native tribe like are really cool. And I think that's really neat. And I love that. I'm sorry Hollywood didn't, didn't do it. That would have been cool. But also, like, it's fucking Hollywood. What do you expect? I would never expect them to do that or be angry that they they didn't do that. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's like, tied into that uh, early, like, baby understanding of Hollywood and racism mm-hmm. and being like, well, just because you make, like, just because you cast someone as a person of color doesn't mean that that character is a person of color like like it is but it's like rue is black and is meant to be black because there is a connection with what is happening in uh the riots the uprising in district 11 and the anger of a girl of color being brutally murdered and that actually being whether you want to call it an allegory or a reference or an inference into something that is happening within that community and that is very very important Yes. Uh, if you just took Katniss and made her black, that wouldn't necessarily change the character. In fact, I think it would do a disservice because a lot of things happen to Katniss that would not like be representative of of that lived experience. Yeah. Um, so it's just it's just it's just a different kind of situation, right? Yes. And like- I and I think. Katniss is Katniss is racially ambiguous is the truth you could cast any race as Katniss it wouldn't really change anything about the character and and maybe in like a decade from now they'll they'll redo they'll re-release Hunger Games as some kind of prestige tv show and Katniss won't be white like I could see that but I don't think it would change anything I don't think it would change anything and I think that people were expecting it to and it's like that doesn't change it if yeah. you want to see if you want to see stories where the race of a of the character is important, you need to be making sure that you are telling stories where the main character's race is important. Yeah. Which we have so many different stories about that now. Mm-hmm. Uh 
Hunger Games, it would have been, it, it, it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. Uh, other than the representation and seeing people, it, it, but like, that's not the p- thing that people are arguing for. Yeah. I mean, it's not. And it's, it is kind of like um, a very childish understanding of how the mechanisms of Hollywood kind of yes. work in regards to casting and representation and things of that nature. It's intro um, to diver- it's intro to diversity 101 and yeah, we're yeah, like yeah. sitting there and being like let's let's get to 202 or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the, no, the internet stays on the 101 of topics forever and they will never leave it. Um but that's, you know. <laughs> that's cuz the internet I'm... is mostly full of just like random people and teenagers. <laughs> that's true. Uh so that's that's kind of our like what the fuck about this fandom yep so uh, so acknowledging that that happened and uh and go watch azara i think is the name of the person that made that video go watch her video about um it's called like the day rue became black and it's excellent it's and it goes way more so into depth good. on these topics yes and that's it makes some amazing points yeah all right let's talk about what we love oh my god uh because as much as much as we just talked about like how much there were things that we disliked or things that we were met on uh this, in my mind, is the perfect adaptation of mm-hmm, a mm-hmm. novel, a YA novel, to a movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're going to talk about why. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So I spent um, I spent so much time complaining about certain things. But the truth is, we cut the summary section because it's not necessary. Because it really is good. So, yeah. okay. So here's the thing. The cast with three exclamation points. So Landon oh, wrote that. I normally God. delete a lot of her punctuation when she puts that in. But I was like, no, no, this is accurate. This is so accurate. So I picked a couple of um of uh, of actors in this that um I think. I just wanted to highlight, but oh my God, I could literally just put the entire cast. No. Everyone does a good job. Is there a single bad performance? I don't think there's a single bad performance in this movie. So. And I and I think that there are times where we sit there and we go, holy shit, right? Of course. Like the fact that you chose these three is amazing, but I'm also like, oh, and also Stanley Chichi. And yes. also J Law. And also yes. this person. Like, I think that the only person that I met about is uh oh, God, what's his name Hemsworth, but I, I, I also think that like like it's not necessarily a commentary on his acting. And what did you do back back to Gale? Yeah, you character. just don't like Gale right, very like, much because I think I think he does a great job, a especially job. in Walking Jack yeah. with Gale. He does. He, 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 it's not that he does a bad job, but he's like, like, okay, if I had to bring the performances, he would be near the bottom. But that's just because there's so many fan freaking fantastic performances. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Literally everyone in this movie is amazing. Pitch perfect. So good. Oh, so no. Good. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Aria. I'll see oh, if I can okay. refresh on my end, if that fixes it. Hopefully it will. I didn't hear the oh. glitch, by the way. It's it's going to be it's Twitch doing it to you. Twitch and Zoom. Oh my gosh. But yeah, the <laughs> cast is amazing. <laughs> the cast is so good and everyone plays their characters so well. Like I don't I don't know like what exactly the actors were were given to um to help them understand their characters if they were actually tasked with reading the books or what exactly happened. Um but like there's not a single performance that I think doesn't match how they are in the books. Like everyone, I'm like, oh yeah, of course that's how BD would move and sound and act. Oh yeah, of course that's exactly um what President Coin's expression would be in that moment. You know what I mean? Like it's just so perfect. So good. Uh, I think, I think, I think uh, also the interviews and the way people talk about, about working on these projects, projects and everyone was so honored, honored to be a part of it and excited, excited to be a part of it. And I know it's just like, like taking in this job, job as like, like a, oh, whatever. whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I think that they all, like, like, I just want to if you can't not a big fan of the Hunger Games movie series, and so I like watch interviews and watch people talk about their their time experience, and everyone had such genuinely good success. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. So, All right. In addition to the cast, the costuming and set designs, I had so much trouble picking screenshots for this too. I love that. I'm, I'm very glad you chose this house. I think that's one of the most amazing ones. Oh, especially when it's all um, pink like this. Isn't that like yes. the best shot? There are uh, so many good shots of costumes and set just, designs. Oh my god! Also, that scene in, in general is just such a great the pink snow house where, where they're, uh, they're, they're at the party and people from the club are offering them this drink that'll make them throw up. 
so, so that they can start again. again. Very Roman, and very, very Roman, Roman, very of the, of the, of the, of the, the motif we're trying, trying to go for. Mm -hmm. But just so good, the costume, the set design, every single character, of every, every single uh, situation, like, going from, from knowing, from knowing that all three places exist in this place, place, and they're, they're all chosen, chosen to, 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 for, for the sole purpose of this, this of, like, oh, oh, oh the whole culty sort, sort of, of everywhere in white, white with a little bit of red, red uh, around, around the circle. And look at the know. costumes for the Capitol people. Like, how there's, like, yeah. all this sea of black because that is how, because they're, they're about to witness death, but they're excited about it. So there's all these, like, pops of color as if it's, like, yes. a cool thing, you know? Uh, yes. It's, 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 and then, of course, the, the, the houses of the, like, extravagance of, of the different, different, uh, different projections, different lighting. It's just, it's so good. And, and um, everything being on, even, even, you know, I know, know it's not on here, but, like, like how does your 12 look like? Yes. Uh, what, what District 13 look like? I, I believed we were in an underground bunker in District 13 that had been this is what you wear for i for almost put a district disease. 13 screenshot on there but i had i already had the screenshot from that we talked about in the mockingjay episode so i was like no i'll leave it out they already know i love the look of district 13. <laughs> no i i think that every single set and every single mm -hmm. costume was purposeful mm -hmm. and designed and got us feeling something yes it yes. wasn't just for the like the like oh we have an outrageous costume budget we can use it it was like oh no there is a purpose behind the capital having long eyelashes or this yes. that the other thing there's serious artistry in both the costuming and set design in, in these movies in in a way that you um that you don't always you don't always see um but it's particularly good in the hunger games i think i i like to re i like to really relate the costuming and set design to be as purposeful as I feel like a movie like The Devil Wears Prada was with uh, yes. like its costuming. Yes. Is that like it really was every single thing was thought about and you can you can stop a scene anywhere in the movie mm -hmm. and figure out like that was chosen for this emotion to portray this thing to show this thing yep like, like i you wish could really like i wish there were longer shots of like in the first and second movies of the the other districts costumes i mean you get little shots of them like they're in there but like i want longer shots like i want to see what they really look like so i can like fully analyze them but they're just very quick shots you don't get to but um but i find myself wanting to so desperately and I think that uh, the the costumers and set designers took into account uh, with all of this too that a lot of this movie a a is about or takes place in a place that is so focused on the physical looks and focused on aesthetics mm -hmm. that that's why they had to be so hyper vigilant with this. Yes. At no point in time did it was anything chosen because it was cool. Mm -hmm. uh, there was in character or in world reasons for everything to be chosen mm -hmm. because it had to be it had to match the capital which was so hyper focused on yes. fashion. Yes. So we love it. The visuals of this yes. movie are amazing. They could just, it's it just, it, the first movie would have been so good without the shaky cam and I could have actually seen, seen things that I wanted to see. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. Also, also, we feel like this particular um, movie is so good at being an adaptation because it's not shot for shot, which shot for shot adaptations, in my opinion, are boring. Like, why'd you make it? I could have just read the book if you're going to do shot for shot. Right. Yes. And it's all the changes that are in there. Like I can totally see how they arrived at those changes. Even the ones that I kind of I'm like, eh, I'm not so happy with that. Um, I see how why they did it. And I can understand even to the point that I think like I might have made the same decision, you know. Yes. So I, it's good. <laughs> they treated they. Tr <laughs> Uh, they, sorry, this is going to be an off the wall comparison. My brain makes metaphors so weirdly. Uh, they treated it like modern day Christians treat the Bible where it's like, oh, it's up for a little bit of interpretation. <laughs> uh, we're keeping, we're keeping to the purpose, but it's a little bit of interpretation. Unlike some things where it's like, we have to copy it exactly, or just throw out whole sections. Looking at you, Harry Potter, who just decided Dobby wasn't important. Like you would never come back. Oh, uh, yeah. 
like it really did keep the it, it really did keep the energy and the purpose of it and i felt suzanne collins was probably really like a part of i know that she's not on the writing team Mm -hmm. but like she was a part of the making of this she had to have been like i know she's not credited but like it it somehow like somehow the writers like understood at this very deep level so it makes it hard for me to imagine that she didn't she wasn't involved and she wasn't yeah i mean her her specter must have been over like they must have had like a a wwsd like what would suzanne do or just (laughs) you know or just had a conversation with her i know so many writers who would love to like not necessarily like write the screenplay or be a part or be a producer but to just be like hey what was the purpose of this? Yeah. What was the spirit of this? And what can we do to make sure that, like, what are the top three things that we need to make sure happens so mm-hmm. that spirit is kept? It and then feel we like can build an adaptation happened. around it. Yeah. And, and, and like to include, like, obviously we have no proof that it was, that it happened, but to include a writer in the room for that reason, uh, to keep the work of art of what something was created alive, mm-hmm. I think is incredibly important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that that's probably what made this as amazing as it was. It does feel like that. It does feel like that's the case. And that, and I think probably was like a give or take on both ends that, that Suzanne did not demand to, we've seen what happens when authors demand to be a part of the script Oof. and directly a part of the direction and it's directly a <laughs> Uh, go watch our very- um go watch our uh, a fantastic beast episode if you would like to know yes. more about what landon's talking about <laughs> uh fantastic beasts are also reading a lot about how uh anything to do with uh 50 shades of gray mm-hmm. and the filming of that happened um <laughs> some really interesting some really interesting stuff happened there yeah. uh and so she was able to let it go but they also respected her yeah. position as a writer. That is how and it I seems. Genuinely, I, I genuinely think that must have happened. Yeah, definitely seems that way for sure. So in addition to that, because these movies are not from just from Katniss's perspective, we get a whole bunch of added scenes. And you know what? I, we really like the added scenes, okay? So we've got a couple that we want to talk about. Um, I just want to give a shout out again to a lot to the scenes that show like the growing revolution um, yes. I know that that's that the dam breaking one in particular was what I talked about in my favorite things. But those scenes, those additional scenes or those extended scenes um, that show the actual revolution uh, is just it's amazing. Like, I love every single one. I of love um, the scene that you have a screenshot of um, uh, of I believe that's district 12. They're marching um, up. They're marching up to marching the forward. Dam. Yes to the dam oh that's up to the dam yes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then um also the the uh the one with district the, the lumber district uh of them climbing the trees mm-hmm. and sending off the fucking bombs so cool so good so yeah. good uh so cool. i think also the most powerful for me was in the very first movie when rue died and we watch her family react to the death and fighting breakout yep. and just like knowing that this is the first of many and that they had chosen to show it meant that they can never not show it not not to be a little whiny bitch again but i wanted to include a screenshot of that and i tried and they all looked garbage because of the shaky cam so anyways it was a really emotional moment <laughs> yes uh, really i think i think that that 100 percent added and was part of the amazing world building that the that the world that the the director and the writers did because Mm -hmm. it really did realize that like this is not just Katniss's story this is the world of a revolution and it's not just one person who causes a revolution yep um in addition to Um, that we also love all of the scenes with snow I know that Landon mentioned that for her favorite things but Honestly, like all the additional scenes showing him having conversations with the different people and expressing his opinion directly is great. I don't know if there's a bad scene with Snow. And don't get me wrong. It, it, I think Sutherland, I think, is the actor. He's freaking amazing as yeah, Snow. Yeah, Sutherland. Uh, uh, but like the writing of all mm-hmm. of the scenes and the expansion of this character and just every single thing from 
like coughing into a napkin and bleeding Mm -hmm. uh to to this moment of like someone putting his hair perfectly in place it's so good it's so good and the thing is is like with these with these scenes even though we don't see them in the book especially the snow scenes it's very clear that no like oh no this is this is what was happening like it all matches so well i consider these scenes canon i do too uh because they they have to be Mm -hmm. Every single one of them has to be canon Mm -hmm. Uh, because, yes, why else would the rules change uh, if Sitika hadn't been told by Snow to change the rules? Mm -hmm. Why, like, and why would Snow do that? It's not because for entertainment purposes, it's because there needs to be something to keep the people in line. Like, oh, so good. Yes. So Um, good indeed. Speaking of Seneca, this is also, man, all we know is that Seneca dies. Seneca Crane dies. Uh, We we don't necessarily, we have rumors of how, but it is never shown. I think one of the most powerful, like, inferences. It's the first time I watched a movie inference something and me, like, get it. Of him uh-huh. walking into the room and there just be a bowl of berries. That yeah, they just lock him in the room. Locked. They lock him in the room with a bowl of berries and they're like, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, it's, it, it says it's casually cruel. It's like, hey, we're not even going to bother killing you. This is your own mistake. So you have to kill yourself the way that you were fooled. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. What? Yeah. Um, now there is one added scene that I am not a fan. Yeah, oh my god, it's such a good scene, Aria. So there, there. Well, there's two. There's two of these added scenes that I'm not as much of a fan of. And the first one I want to talk about is this one right here. This one doesn't bother me as much as the other. So I'm gonna talk about it first. But whenever they have the snow has the conversation about the quarter quell idea, where they're gonna pull from the from the victors, um, and basically uh, Plutarch is the one that has this idea. And I am not sure the idea originating from him matches with everything else you see his character do to support the rebellion. Now, Landon has an explanation that makes this make sense. I still don't agree with it. I feel like it would be better if it was Snow's idea and he pushed Plutarch to doing it. That feels more true to Plutarch's character to me. Um, But go ahead with your justification, Landon. I want everyone to hear it. My idea is that uh, the... If if Katniss had not been pulled back into the arena, her, the hype around her and the rebellion around her would have died. Uh, it would have it, it, it. Snow's plan to have her marry Peta, to have her live the life of a victor, would eventually have gotten to the people where people would not be angry or would not be as so fully support and ready to revolutionize as they were, and Plutarch having his hand on the beat of the politics of all of the districts knew that and knew that there had to be something else one last thing whether that be Katniss dying in the ring or showing or like actually just having to push her in that direction uh to to really get the people to turn on what the games are uh to use the emotion, the high emotion of what people were feeling against them. And it feels like a very kingmaker move, which is what this character is. So I think I, I think that trope-wise, this scene makes sense. And also the character we see in the movies, this scene makes sense. I think Plutarch is a very different character when it is only through Katniss's eyes. Um, I would agree because, with that second part for sure. Um, because, Katniss's understanding of Plutarch is quite different than how Plutarch probably really is. And you see that and, in movies. And, and I think Plutarch is is manipulating her. Uh, as he well, does yeah, I mean, basically you think he was, trying, he was trying to martyr her. Like he was trying to get her killed in yes. the games. And I just, that's where I'm like, I just don't know if he would go that far. That just doesn't seem right to me. Um, I, I get the trope though. And that's clearly what they were going for and what they want you to think. I just am not... I just don't think that, that that's I him. think, and, and it might not have been Margaret. I think I think that it, it w- either would have been fine. Mm-hmm. If she died, great. If she doesn't die, great. Either like is he's cool fine. either way. It, 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 that's better than it, than her 
uh, fading into obscurity and becoming a capital pet, which yeah. is or which is what she would have done if she wasn't thrown back into the games. Well, that is true. That is true. So, like, I don't I don't disagree with that. I just feel like from his perspective, if his goal is to get her over to 13 so that he can help, she can help with the rebellion. There's no reason to throw her back in the arena. He could just get her over to 13. And so that's where I'm like, I just don't think it would be his idea. I, I I could totally see if Snow had the idea, him being like, oh, yeah, and then go along with it. I'm just not sure about it being his idea. Fair. Uh, I, I think I just, I really like that Kingmaker character. And it seems like just such a Kingmaker choice to be like, I am moving the pieces around the board and no, but it's, it's the same. It's the Peter, Peter Baelish. Character. Yeah. 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 It's like, it's That's just what he's doing. that it, it, he's just playing everybody around him and no one really knows where he is. And we get such a kind, eager Plutarch from Katniss's point of view. And he's not that. And this, and this, this shows that. Yeah, uh, and it shows how powerful movie. and influential he is. Yeah. I think um, I just, I think I just like Katniss's version of him better. Than, his, than the there. movie version. <laughs> um, and there's I think, one... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I think like also at this point in time when we meet Plutarch, we are begging for someone to be on Katniss's side yes. from the Capitol. And we do not have that. And so like meeting somebody who is, is something that we're like, oh my God, somebody, somebody yeah. from this place, you know, other than Cinna, other than Cinna. Yeah. Because uh, you, know, you know, living in this world that like, there's a lot of people in the Capitol that don't agree with what the Capitol is doing. A ton. Yeah. We know this. And yet we rarely ever get to see it because the story is from Katniss's perspective. Well, and also they're profiting from it. Like yes. they might not agree with what the capital is doing, but they're certainly not in the line of oppression. So they're yeah, not going they're like, to change you know, the status you know, quo. This sucks, but man, I got to eat too. Sorry. <laughs> and I think as I think that living in a capitalist society where we probably relate to a lot of the people in the capital yes. more than we necessarily relate to anybody else, but we're also like to think of ourselves more of a ally more of a plutarch more of a someone who would who is trying to change and educate we want to see more of ourselves in stories like this yes uh and there aren't any characters like that yeah there's and just really... there's just plutarch and cinna that's kind of it yeah yeah there, i mean effie, plutarch... effie has and to come around she's not like that at first she's no she, and then i think effie shows that growth but effie doesn't show that growth necessarily in the books because we no. don't really see her she shows no. it in the movies yeah. Which is why I think Effie is a much lovable, is a very lovable character in the books, yeah. much more lovable in the movies. Yes. yes. Um, because she has that realization and Cinna dies. Mm -hmm. Like that, that thing, if you're relating, it. if you're relating to Cinna because you're like, I am an ally that wants to see this change. Uh, and Cinna dies. The last yeah. thing you want to, you're like, do you see what allyship I, gets you? <laughs> where do I fit in on this? Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's like, Okay, I, I so I can totally understand liking that version of yes. Plutarch more. Yes, uh, for sure. But the evil part of me is just like, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> for sure. And then there's one other scene not pictured in this this screenshots, but one other scene that's added that I dislike, and that is when Katniss goes to the hospital in Mockingjay. In the books, she goes to the hospital. They tell her there is there is no scheduled raids at the time, so it's going to be safe for her to go there. And then a raid comes, and then she is told they're they're told that like, oh, you know, we knew about this. You're not the target. They don't even know you're here. And so, because of these conflicting pieces of information in the books, it's incredibly ambiguous about whether they know Katniss is there, whether Coin knew it was coming. Maybe Coin sent her in. Maybe they they're they're lying and they they just don't know. And they did see Katniss and they sent in the raid for Katniss. Like you don't know in the books, you don't know. In the movie, there's an additional scene with Snow where they're like, "Oh, Katniss is there. We should send a raid." And Snow's like, "Yeah, send a raid. Kill that bitch." Right? And that scene doesn't exist in the books and in the movies, it removes all the ambiguity. So in the movies, what that means is like, "Oh, it, this actually can't possibly be Coin's fault." Um, okay, I guess. I liked thinking it could maybe possibly be be Coin's fault and Coin actually sent her to her death and then just it just didn't happen. Um, so it's just it's just a preference for ambiguity. It's the yeah. same reason that I really dislike the epilogue in the movies, except that this choice doesn't actively make me angry. It's just kind of disappointing. Um, so, yeah. 
ambiguity is the death of movies it's true it's <laughs> it's true. really you have to be a really niche and skilled director to have ambiguity feel satisfying in a movie uh yeah it's there, much easier in there, a book it's it is it's, it's because also there's like a satisfaction of build-up of time uh ambiguity is also something that happens it takes a sec like it it takes time that scene and that decision and Katniss thinking over those choices is a full three pages in the book when you're looking at a 300 page book that's that's a whole last percent dedicated to that movement you don't have that as much in movies you don't yeah. have that time yep. to dedicate to it Dif- different uh, mediums different tools I 100% agree with you. I think it's a much it's it, it's it raises and foreshadows uh coins evilness much more than uh than necessarily the the movies show us. However, I think they make up for it showing coin getting more charismatic, which is something we kind of see in the books but certainly see a lot more in but the it, movies. But it's hard in the books to portray that because it's so hard yes. for to win Katniss over. Katniss is so hard to impress. So we don't get to see that. No. So I think I think that there is a place where it, like they still do it successfully. They yeah. still give you, you that same feeling of building of mistrust in coin. Uh, it just has to be done in different ways. Yeah. And that's I just like part the of the adaptation. The books, that's all. I agree. Uh, but yeah. like that's part of the adaptation, but like that that recognizing that this important thing has to be taken away and it has mm-hmm. to be given somewhere else, I think is part of what makes this movie amazing. Yeah, and this is part I mean that's part of also why like we really think that these are great adaptations. Cuz yes. they they hit all the same beats. Even the things that they change, they hit all the same beats. Um we would be remiss to not mention uh Philip Seymour Hoffman in this. Uh, he passed away, uh, via su- suicide drug overdose, um, about ha- about three quarters of the way into it shooting. Was, it was during the filming of, um, of Mocking Jay and part one, so, part two. Yeah. yeah. And so he got to film all of his part one scenes, but there are part two scenes that he was supposed to film that he did not get to film because yeah. of this. Um, um, very, very tragic. He's so talented. Um, if you ever get to see Philip Seymour Hoffman in other movies, I can't think of a single performance that I believe he does a bad job. He's excellent. He's excellent at his job. Um, and, uh, it was in sometimes Hollywood, Hollywood is a money-making machine and it's really, really tough because sometimes we watch actors die and Hollywood steamroll ahead and just try to make money off of them. Uh, Robin Williams being one of them. Like people like that, it, there is very little care for the person. And I remember this happening and the people and the industry paying a huge amount of respect for Philip Seymour Hoffman because there was also a huge this kind of ties into our next thought, but there was also this huge idea of knowing that he hadn't finished filming and this conversation as to whether or not there was going to be a CGI version of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they were going to take audio from rehearsals and put it in and CGI him. Because the, the uh, technology for, for doing this did exist. It wasn't, at, the CGI at the time wasn't the CGI of today. It wasn't quite as developed, but there was there was a possibility that we were going to get a Philip Seymour Hoffman CGI scene. Uh, and people responded very negatively to that in Hollywood. Yeah. And there was a lot of respect both for this actor, for the situation that was happening. Uh, the fandom was very kind about it. Um, I, I think that there was a lot of there, there it was it was a very tragic thing that happened. Um, but like watching people come together and support and raise money and awareness of the situations that were happening during this time was was incredible to watch and witness um and so we just you know it's it's out there it's definitely part of the big history of the movies and his relationship with them and so it's important to talk about 
And um, and so basically the main and as far as the results of the movie, the main thing that we see that we know was changed based off of his passing was the scene where Hamish comes in and reads a letter from Plutarch to Katniss. That was that it's pretty well uh, known that that was supposed to be a scene between Plutarch and Katniss that he just never got to finish filming. And so they changed it. Um, yeah. Everything else was edited around. Uh, but that was the major scene change that uh, that was the result of this. Uh, and I think it's still an incredibly touching scene. Yes. And I think that like the way that they did it, instead of changing it from like being like a letter from Hamish or a letter from somebody else, like they they kept space for the character. Mm-hmm. And as as a fan watching kept space in some way for Philip Seymour Hoffman yeah. to exist and know that his absence was felt, but it not negatively impact anything. Like they, they held it, it. It's a delicate balance. And I think they held it really well. Yeah, they did. And, and another kind of big kudos in this movie to like how respectful and, uh, and well-treated the actors were, at least from what we know, um, has to do with uh, with Josh Hutcherson and uh, and Peta. Guess what? Peta didn't do for this movie. He actually didn't lose a ton of weight. This shot and all of the shots like this are CGI, and um, and they did a great job. Like he looks wasted. They also didn't require he gain a lot of weight, Mm-mm. or like for for how like because he gets he gets a little buff. Obviously, so does. Uh, Gale, Gale certainly mm-hmm. as he starts and joins the military, they didn't require that of their actors. They did not sit there and say, you have to change your bodies. No. Uh, and uh, certainly with losing as much fucking weight as Josh Hutcherson would have had to lose if he played PETA this way. Like, yeah. no, thank God. <laughs> yeah. And there's multiple interviews where they asked him like, gosh, how much weight did you lose for mocking Jay? And his answer is always the same. <laughs> none that's the magic of makeup and cgi like that's his answer basically every time yeah um they didn't and uh, and i think it looks great like i didn't know when i watched the movie i was like damn how much weight they make him lose none is the answer I'm not a pound any anything that he did for his weight was his choice they did not yeah. ask him to do that and also important to mention philip seymour hoffman was not cgi'd at all no uh all of his scenes were edited around so uh but I think that they they also like could have done a shit ton of CGI, not not with Seymour Philip Seymour Hoffman, but just like with the technology of what is mentioned in the Hunger Games, and chose not to. Yeah. And I have to applaud a uh, movie with a large budget that could have access to do really cool things just for sticker value and shock value uh, on the technology front, and chose not to do it for the betterment of the movie. Uh, thank you, director. We love practical effects. Oh, God. And, and Hunger Games, for the most part, is practical effects. There's there's a couple. Um, I'm not sure if the sludge scene in the first Mockingjay or second Mockingjay is is practical it, that, or if it's that's CGI. CGI. I'm pretty sure it is CGI. I didn't yeah. know. I didn't know if it was a mix of of two because there's ways that you can like make miniatures and stuff. But a like lot that. of the scenes are a mix <sighs> of two. Yeah. That's how it's supposed to be used. And uh, I think that that's something that just makes this We've forgotten so that. Nice. We've forgotten that. Um, it, you know, in and I, I want to say, like, I feel like since about, I don't know, five or six years ago, it's like we forgot. It's like we yeah. forgot how to properly use CGI. Hunger Games is a great example of how to properly use CGI. Um, and I, yeah, and I think that, like, t- as technology forwards, as it becomes less expensive to use CGI than it would necessarily to shoot, shoot these practical uh, shots, we're going to see more and more CGI. We're going to see more and more AI. Uh, things are going to start changing a lot in Hollywood. Yeah, um, even more so than now. And a big reason for that is that the the practical effects and, and makeup artists and, and stuff, they're unionized and the vi- virtual effects artists are not unionized. So this is a big reason that we should all be supporting the um, the protests and strikes that are going on right now. 
uh, and why we be, should, we should be supporting any VFX studio that does become unionized, because yes. some of them are trying to become unionized now. We should be supporting it so that we can have more situations where these things are being used appropriately and artistically, as opposed mm-hmm. to being used because they're incredibly cheap. And because the reason they're incredibly cheap is literally because the VFX studios do not have unions. That's yes. why. Uh, not because they're actually cheaper. They're not actually cheaper. They're not. Um, obviously, because this is has been uh, out for years and years and years, this is not shucked work. Uh, but I, I think that it is important to talk about uh, the strike and what is happening and how it is affecting us. And to remind you guys, just like Karen was saying, to remind anybody who's listening or watching this, that uh, TV is going to be boring for the next six months. And Mm -hmm. to just let it be boring in order to make better stuff in the future. If we want books instead, play some video games instead. If we want movies of this quality of of who and directors and actors and writers of this quality, we need to make sure that they are protected. Mm -hmm. Uh, We need to support the WGA. We need to support SAG-AFTRA, and we need to continue to push for uh, unionization in. Uh, in visual effects and other places in Hollywood because it is so important uh, that our artists are being taken care of out there. Uh, Because when you take care of the artists, you get movies like The Hunger Games. Yeah. And and you get, you get, you get uh, actors and writers and, and costume sets and designers who obviously give a shit about the thing that they are creating If you have actors and writers that are underpaid and undervalued and taken advantage of every single day and cannot afford, I mean, obviously the stars of the cast of the Hunger Games can afford, but the amount of actors that they had that were stunt doubles or were uh, extras in the series is inc- those those guys deserve to eat and deserve to have health insurance and deserve to be paid for the work that they are doing uh and and we need to make sure that, that the whole big crowds that happen in the opening ceremonies of each hunger games are not replaced by ai duplicates like we need to make sure that people are still making movies and that those people are deserved to live healthy functioning lives where they don't have to worry about their family's health insurance being pulled out from underneath their feet for sure. So that's our fun little soapbox to stand on. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a little aside based on the CGI in the Hunger Games, which is really good, actually. Which is really good. Uh, right. But the important question that we ask every single time is, Karen, did this movie series resonate? Oh, my God, yes. Like, not quite as much as the books for me. I still do overall prefer the books. But there's so much that these movies add um, that I really do feel like they are excellent companion pieces to the books and rereading the books made me excited to rewatch the movies when I knew we were going to get here. Um, definitely didn't feel that way when we were doing Harry Potter. Um, it, you know, it, the, I, I like a lot about the Harry Potter movies, but, um, where the Harry Potter movies are kind of like, uh, get like a B score in how they ad- do their adaptation hunger game just takes this to the next level a plus a plus adaptations uh, if if there are people who want to I, I movies aren't being adapted as much anymore things are becoming more like uh mini series and tv shows but uh this is how you adapt a movie mm-hmm. from a book series and a fandom series this is how you do it yeah. uh you get an, a, a fine understanding of what the point is what it is that attract why this thing because there are so many kinds of this story that could have been big why is it this one Mm -hmm. what is the base of that and you do the things to celebrate that and that is the base of what this was so so Um, Landon, i feel like you've already said it but just to make it official so landon do the hunger games movies resonate for you (laughs) Fuck yes, they do. My favorite, one of my absolute favorite things to do is watch people, especially grown men who were not part of the Hunger Games fandom, watch the Hunger Games for the first time and A, understand how incredibly important these movies are, what the point is of these movies, and like uh, just comment on all the things that we talked about uh, and, and, and get it. Uh, it's so fun to watch people who are not fans of this watch the series and get it. And those are you can find those on like YouTube and TikTok, right? Oh like yeah, first they're a hundred percent. 
absolutely they're 100 percent free and you you watch as people who just assumed this was a another twilight a love triangle series watch this and realize like what actually mattered in this series yeah and being able to relate it the lessons that they watch and learn to modern contemporary stuff 10 years later mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so good just so, so good, good. So, all right, everyone go out and watch Hunger Games, basically. Yeah, go watch it. It's <laughs> actually, you can actually watch the movies for free on YouTube with ads right now. That's where they are at the moment. So, yes, you can watch them. Uh, there. They are there. All right. So, Landon, we're at the, we're at the end of the episode. What, what, what would you like to plug? Where can every, everybody find you? You can find me at Land in Maine at uh, Instagram, but I'm going to let you know that my TikTok has been popping off recently. Uh, Your girl wrote 100,000 words of a novel uh, in about 30 days. Everyone, Uh, please say congratulations to to Landon. She did complete her goal of finishing a first draft um, before the school year started again. So she does have a first draft of her Mm -hmm. novel. So congratulations. Thank you. It is. I am incredibly proud. Uh, I hate it currently, but that's normal. But it's I'm done. Telling but girl, it's done it's and you're going to like the second it's done, better. And it's and it can only go up from here. That's right. This is the um, worst version of the book that ever will exist. And I'm very excited about that because there are parts of it that I do love. Uh, so the book coming soon. The other thing too is that it's August, and um, I I know that it's it's down in the comments. It's plugged whenever it's shown. But uh, I have a class list for my classroom. I'm a sixth grade mm-hmm. English and uh, English for reading and writing teacher. And uh, unfortunately, because of how our school system works, there are things like whiteboards markers and erasers and things that are not covered in the school budget and I always am very appreciative of anybody who is willing to donate uh anything to supply for my classroom if you cannot please do not feel pressured to there is nothing it will will be fine but uh that is what I'm going to plug right now so go watch my tiktoks or follow me on instagram uh and my links to my amazon page are there yeah, I need to update your your thing with your TikTok link, but it's it's land in Maine, just like you guys see for the Instagram yes. and Twitter on TikTok, and then the Amazon wish list is there. You guys can click on it and take a look. All right, Please, for me, here's all of my things. Um, you can follow me on YouTube. This is where we post all of our vods. I would also love if you're not following me currently on Twitch to please do that. Um, we we do stream every uh, Saturday and Sunday from noon to four Eastern time. So this is the main spot you can find me. I'm also on Blue Sky. Hell yeah. If you go to my Twitter, you'll find my Blue Sky link. I'm going to try to use that more. I know it's invite only right now, but if you have a Blue Sky, you could follow me on there. Um, that's what I'm choosing to plug today. Um, so yeah. All right. What we're going to do next is um, is we are going to actually say we're going to stop the recording. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe down below. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right.